give us what you've, what you've learned or what you're learning. All right. Well, um, just a few months ago at ICAC IDSA, we, we heard the results of the NA Accord study, which was this big conglomeration of clinical databases that tried to imitate a clinical trial that was randomizing people to either start uh, above 350 or wait till they had fallen to a CD4 below 350. And that study showed a 70% uh, greater mortality if you waited until after you were below 350. Uh, and the investigators at that time promised that, that at Croy they were going to present further data looking at the question of 500, and that's what they did at this meeting. So the idea of the study is you take this observational database of people uh, who enter the study with CD4 counts above 500, and um, you, you look at those who start within a year and a half of first meeting that criterion or those who don't. And you sort of think of the first group as the people who are randomized to the immediate group, if you will, and the second group is the people who are randomized to the deferred group. Um, and uh, what they found was, again, a 60% decreased mortality in people who started uh, after their CD, uh, above 500 as opposed to waiting to below 500. Um, this, of course, is not the same as a true randomized controlled trial where you actually randomize people to take treatment early or late. It's attempting to imitate that trial, but of course with an observational study there are a lot of potential confounders, you know, people who start early may be very different in many ways from people who decide to wait. Um, and that always is a, is a problem with observational data. On the other hand, these investigators have done uh, as good a job as you can do in trying to eliminate those confounders. And um, uh, so I think it's a very sophisticated technique and uh, the question is just whether people will buy data from an observational uh, study like this mm -hmm. as being an acceptable substitute a for a trial. Study. And there is a, there is a trial that has been funded um, to look at this question, but of course it's going to be a, an expensive, yeah. time-consuming trial, and, and are we willing to wait uh, that long for the results? So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out in, in terms of the acceptance of these results. I, I will say that they're not the only study to show benefit to early therapy. There have been a number of other observational studies mm -hmm. that have also shown benefit. But when you get up to this level of 500, uh, you know, it becomes harder and harder to show mm -hmm. a difference. Mm -hmm. And not all the trials have, or not mm -hmm. all the observational studies have shown a difference at that level. You, you wanted to cover the uh, switch mark and uh, marks, and, and um, can you talk about sure. that? Yeah. Yeah, so there, there actually haven't been a whole lot of clinical trials at this meeting, which is a little unusual. I, I usually I come here and I talk about mm -hmm. trial X and Y and Z, and, and haven't been a lot of those. But there was one uh, important trial, the Switchmark study, um, and uh, this is a study of Raltegavir or Icentris, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, we've we've now seen several something mark studies. We saw the benchmark and then the start mark. So benchmark mm -hmm, was mm -hmm. Raltegavir in treatment experience patients, then start mark in naive patients. So now switch mark took people who were doing well on a protease inhibitor based regimen and switched them to Raltegavir versus staying with their protease inhibitor. And what they found was that while their lipids got better with the switch, uh, there, there were more virologic failures, um, mm -hmm. that uh, people were actually better off staying with their protease inhibitor. Mm -hmm. uh, frankly, I think that was to, entirely predictable because what happened was they let people into the study even if they had previously failed other regimens. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of them probably had nucleoside resistance. And when, they're, when you're switching from a boosted PI, which is a, has a pretty big barrier to resistance, to raltegavir, which is a very potent drug, but, but is fragile in the sense of mutations and doesn't take a lot of mutations to get resistant. Mm -hmm. You know, if your nukes aren't adequate, mm -hmm. you've just gone from a pretty potent regimen to one that is fragile. So they weren't optimizing treatment. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, I don't know why they just chose to do the study mm -hmm. that way. Most switch studies, they take people who are on their first regimen, no history of mm -hmm. failure, mm -hmm. switch them from a PI to raltegavir. If they'd done that, it would have mm -hmm. probably been fine. But it was the inclusion of those people who weren't, who weren't on good nukes, I suspect, that, that mm -hmm. caused this problem. And I, although I, it's, it's too bad that they did it that way, I think we can learn something from this. Mm -hmm. And that is that with all this enthusiasm for Icentris right now, we've got to remember it's not, you know, it's a great drug, but mm -hmm. it isn't a super drug. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it has its weaknesses. And mm -hmm. the most important mm -hmm. weakness is that it really needs to be flanked by other good drugs. Mm -hmm. We learned that from the original treatment experience patient study. So I have seen in, in the community that people are just thinking, oh wow, I love this drug. 
Mm -hmm. Patient doesn't like drug X, switch them to this. Doesn't like yeah. drug Y, switch them to but this. But we, we've and done that. That's the, the Well, we the, should have learned by now. But everybody's well, been saying, <coughs> it's the drug du jour. I've yeah. got to be on this. I mean, I'm sure you've had people that come, Doc, I really want this drug because yeah. Joe is doing this and Joe and yeah. Sally or whoever else. And, and, you, and you've got your infinite gut feeling and wisdom and, and science, and, and yet you're having a person that's based upon popularity saying they want to be on the drug du jour. Yeah. And how do you, how do you talk to a patient? How do we tell people that, that this, is, this is really serious stuff because you maybe have one chance to move to a, a combo that you may be on for a very long time. I mean, we talking about 8, 10, 15, we don't know, maybe 15 years. And, and you have to really think very, very seriously because this is, this is not the old days of the, the switch to this and I'll try this, maybe I'll move this up and I'll add something else. I mean, those, those are pretty pathetic days when we had that, right. that mono infinite, or what do you call it, virtual monotherapy, virtual monotherapy or yeah. switching from one thing to another it just made it that right, way. Right, right. I mean, yeah, we shouldn't you... be doing that anymore. It's tragic when I see it happen. Mm -hmm. I, I've, just recently saw a patient who came to me who was on Truvada and Icentris and was failing miserably, had complete mm -hmm. resistance mm -hmm. to integrase inhibitors, and he had been heavily treatment experienced, had resistance to everything. So they're putting him on a regimen that has basically been looked at in completely treatment naive patients. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, yeah. how could you think that it would work for this poor guy? But so, so I think we really have to remember that as good as this drug is, you will really use it up fast and waste it mm -hmm. if you don't think about the rest mm -hmm. of the regimen. Right. And, and it's the same would be true for a non-nucleoside. You know, it's, we've, we've heard this before for many other classes of drugs. Mm -hmm. There's nothing new about, about it with Reltegravir, but, but we don't want to repeat the mistakes mm -hmm. of the past. And the only other thing I think you, you were interested in, and I am really interested in as a new booster, is this is really exciting. Uh, as you know, the current standard for using any protease inhibitor is to combine it with, with the low dose of ritonavir or norvir to mm -hmm. try to boost uh, the drug levels of the protease inhibitor. We don't use mm -hmm. ritonavir mm -hmm. anymore for its own antiviral effects. We use it strictly as a pharmacologic booster. Mm -hmm. but, but it does have side effects. It has some GI side effects. It can increase cholesterol and triglycerides. It can sometimes cause some insulin changes or glucose metabolism changes. So. Uh, and it's expensive. So there's been a lot of, uh, of desire to get away from that, use to find a new booster that doesn't have all of those issues and that is heat stable and can be co-formulated with other drugs. Because mm -hmm. right now the only, the only drug that co-formulates uh, ritonavir is Calitra. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a number of companies working on these boosters. Um, Gilead has one and their interest, of course, is because their, their new integrase inhibitor, Elvitegravir, has to be boosted and they would love to have their own booster instead of having to mm -hmm. work with ritonavir. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think everybody in the room was quite surprised to hear that they had already developed a co-formulation mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that includes tenofovir, FTC, Elvitegravir, and their new booster, a four-pill co-formulation mm -hmm. that's already uh, starting mm -hmm. uh, in, in clinical uh, trials. And so far, uh, you know, very short-term studies, looks like it works, at least to boost Elvitegravir. It looks to be well-tolerated. Mm -hmm and they're going to go forward in, in mm -hmm. phase two studies. So that's very mm -hmm. exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be a logical, you know, first line yeah. alternative to a triplet. One pill contains all of these mm -hmm. drugs. Now, their drug could also, in the end, be used to boost protease inhibitors as well, but they're obviously focusing on Elvitegravir, but they're right. saying that they're going to make it available right. uh, for boosting of other drugs as well. Right. Uh, and then Sequoia has a, a drug that they're looking at that they've been studying to boost protease inhibitors. Um, and that also looks promising. There, I was a little concerned about the, uh, the side effects in their short-term studies, some headache, nausea, vomiting, mm -hmm. things we don't like to see. But, but anyway, mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that's going forward. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, there, it may come a time when we have a number of alternatives to, to ritonavir.